Today is Sunday, October 4th, 2020. Last week we've been going over grace, sanctifying an actual grace, as you remember, those who have been here. Sanctifying and actual grace are the foundation of your life. And now everything in regards to your life is going to revolve around this, around grace, how to preserve it, how to make it grow, to understand that there is nothing in life that is comparable to the immense dignity of grace. Grace is, as, and I read and I confirmed this with the, the person that I was quoting last week, and I wasn't 100% sure, but I, I mentioned grace the smallest, he, the way he explains it, the smallest degree of sanctifying grace placed in the soul of an infant just baptized, just what's considered the first grace of baptism, when you receive sanctifying grace. Because when you're born, you do not have sanctifying grace. We are an enemy of God because of the fall of Adam and Eve. We are an enemy of God. But as soon as sanctifying grace enters the soul, we become God's friend. You are holy and pleasing to God. Remember the word heart. The four things which grace gives you. You're an adopted child of God. You have a right to the inheritance of heaven. If you die in the state of grace, you have the right to enter heaven. And the last is you not only receive what's called created grace, sanctifying grace, habitual grace, created grace, but you also receive uncreated grace. You become the temple of the Holy Ghost. God dwells in your soul if you're in the state of grace. He dwells there in a unique way. As you know, our Lord dwells in the Blessed Sacrament. He is their body, blood, soul, and divinity. So, when you receive Holy Communion, if you're in the state of grace, you receive Holy Communion, presuming grace is already in your soul. When the Eucharist comes, you receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. When the species, we say the species of the host dissolves, the body, the blood, and the soul of Christ leave. They're no longer present. But the divinity remains. The divinity lives in you as it does in the Eucharist, except it's in a more perfect and unique place, the proper place, not in the tabernacle. God came not to dwell in tabernacles so much as to dwell in your soul. That's the unique aspect of grace, your dignity, the dignity of the least amount of sanctifying grace in the soul of an, a baptized child at that moment is greater than all the good of the whole universe that God created, including all men and all angels in their natural state before they receive sanctifying grace. In the natural state of angels and men, the smallest degree of sanctifying grace is greater than all of it. To know and to understand the dignity that you have by becoming an adopted child of God by Sanctifying grace is beyond comprehension. You cannot compre comprehend it. You cannot imagine. Just as you cannot imagine the glory of the happiness of heaven. It's impossible. It's like a person who is blind trying to understand the color yellow. Explain it to him. You can't. So, the next thing I talked momentarily last week about and this is related to sin, about temptations. And there is a unique temptation that people should be aware of. And that is, once I mentioned last week, against the sixth and the ninth commandment. Those temptations are unique because they have to be dealt with by a person in a unique way compared to other temptations. And the biggest thing about them is if you find in order to go to confession, which we will talk about later, in order to make an, a good entire confession, what we, we must confess all our sins, right? We know that. Any mortal sins have to be confessed in number, 
and type and any circumstances which changes the gravity of the sin. So if a person kills somebody, that's a sin. If he kills his parent, that's a unique sin. And that needs to be confessed, the, the type of person that was killed. Or if a person kills a consecrated person, a priest, a bishop, it's unique. That, that detail has to be, it's not much of a detail in a sense, but it needs to be confessed along with it. So, in terms of another thing about confession is that a person must, as it says in the act of contrition, I hope you all know, and I believe you do, that the act of contrition. They have it on the sign on in the confessional. I wish they'd kind of take it down, because if a person doesn't know the act of contrition, it's not likely they know how to go to confession either. How do you know what sin is in its detail, and how to confess, and what's the difference between a mortal sin and a venial sin? How a sin is committed? Where a sin is committed? If you don't even know the act of contrition... So, um, people need to know that. Now, with sins in the act of contrition, it says, I must be determined. I am resolved to amend my life, to change my life. And so, if there's an occasion of sin in your life, and you refuse to fight it, to change it, that occasion of sin, those sins are not forgiven. So, take, for example, a person who is disobedient to his parent, a child. And they have other sins too. So, if they are venial sins, then, and the person has no resolve to want to, re to remove the occasion of that sin and stop sinning in that way of disobedience against the parent, that sin is not forgiven. The other venial sins will be if they have true repentance for them, but not that sin. Same with mortal sins. If I am not firmly resolved to do something to avoid the occasion of that sin, you cannot place yourself in the grave occasion of sin. Something that is for you a grave occasion. You can't place yourself in it without committing a sin, except that's the general rule. There are slight exceptions to it when circumstances happen. A person that's learning to be a doctor has to study things that normally we don't. And when a person is studying to be a priest, too, you have to study things I never understood stood word things that people had to discuss and uh, it was quite an eye opener when I was young um, things we had to, to learn um, but we must promise to avoid the occasion of sin so there's a little litmus, litmus test I would say about sins or temptations towards the 6th and the ninth commandment and that is if we feel drawn to something through some, especially through modern technology, which everyone so much loves, our cell phones, our computers, our TVs that are hooked to everything nowadays. Everything runs through TVs and cell phones and computers and it's like this necessity people feel. I have to have this. Not so. If this instrument becomes an occasion of sin to person that they feel drawn to that sin, please, you need to do something about it. Take that, that sign seriously to try to avoid that occasion. Because many men, women included, have fallen and have destroyed them their whole life, their careers, because of this temptation. There have been nations that have gone down because of this vice. Look at King David. Can you remind us what the sixth and ninth commandment? Sixth commandment is thou shalt not commit adultery. Yes. That's the sin of action. The ninth is related to it. Um, the ninth is thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, which is the sins, our Lord was explaining, the sins of desire. Those are the differences. Most people will not accept the fact that there's a sin of desire. Those are the sins of desire, the ninth. And... The way I learned it when I was a little kid, well, I could never figure out what the ninth and the tenth commandment, I always got to make stuff about the sixth is a sixth, you turn it upside down, you get the ninth. So they're related. So um, those are the sins of action, sins of desire. Our Lord said, even if a man looks upon another person with desire, he commits adultery with them. 
So, that's explaining sins of desire, which a lot of people will not accept, unfortunately. So, that is the test to see if, if you are repulsed when these things come up accidentally because of work, because of things that you have to do on the internet at times, if you're repulsed by them, then that's good. And they're probably not a grave occasion of sin for you. So you can be careful. But if something is, if some tool or instrument you think is a necessity in life, and parents be very careful, any children that have these instruments, because they lead many astray. I've seen young kids, because of this type of thing, fall away not only from moral, a moral life, but from their whole faith and their belief in God. Nations have gone down. I've seen old men, old men, almost ready to retire, fall, lose their career, possibly their families, because of this instrument, this weakness that, that is in man. Solomon, King Solomon, the wisest man the world has known. God gave him wisdom that he didn't give to others. And yet the man fell. How? Through this vice. Through this vice. Mm. I was going to say a few more things related. Um, I might have to leave them, but one of them has to do with your... We started talking a little bit more about, and I want to continue a little bit of the details of if you're on the road to holiness, to the interior, learning to what an interior life is and trying to practice a more deep interior life, then some people get discouraged because there's a long way to go and they start late. Let's not be discouraged. And there are reasons I, can, I would like to talk to you about, but I feel that I'm going to go too long on that if I get into it. Um, but there are men, remember, the purpose of your life. Chapter 1 in our Baltimore Catechism. Chapter 1 teaches about the purpose of your life. First, God's glory. And at the same time, concomitantly with it, with God's glory, is your own happiness. First in heaven and also in this life. You won't be happy in this life. You can't be happy in this life. Unless this idea of your salvation and sanctity <coughs> is at the top of the list. You won't be happy without that. It's almost impossible. Especially for those of you who have learned a little bit about what it is, what your purpose of life is. Divine contemplation, divine union, the goal of life in this world, which leads then to the same basic contemplation of God in heaven face to face. But the there have been if if our life is for the first for the glory of God, God makes saints out of people from all different ways and walks of life and at other at, at unique times. There was a man you ever hear of the forty holy martyrs from Sabas. Beautiful story. Forty martyrs that were of the Roman army, I believe. And they were condemned by Diocletian or something, like 320. I don't know if that was Diocletian or not. But condemned to death to die on a cold, frozen lake. They stripped them, and they had to stand there until they died. One man broke away and did not want to die that way. So he ran away, and he died in a warm bath that they prepared for anyone who didn't want to. Well, he died in that bath because of the shock from the cold to the hot. So, one of the other soldiers, one of the soldiers that was standing and watching over them, he saw, he received a little grace from God to see a, a unique light around these men who are dying, these martyrs. And he instantly, he said, I want to be a Christian too. So he took off his clothes and joined them. So the number remained at 40. This man joined them. And he died of one of the martyrs. Never baptized. He received the baptism of blood, which is a true baptism, a true cleansing of the soul. Our Lord talks about it. But it doesn't give character. But some of the theologians say it's a greater way 
to be baptized by blood in a unique way, but you don't receive character. But this man, he lived after his conversion. He received the gift of faith. And about an hour later, he was on the dying. By the next day, they killed anybody that was still had signs of life. They killed them all and burned them. And uh, so this man, very short time, became a saint. There have been other saints that have gone until the end of their lives, maybe only lived for a few weeks and died, but now are in heaven. Some have started very young. St. Teresa, St. Francis of Assisi. Very young. And they became holy. St. Teresa in about 20 years. She became a great saint. So, you can too. If you will do what God says. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart. That's what he told the one man. What should I do to be saved? Love the Lord thy God. As it says in the Old Testament. With thy whole heart, thy whole soul, with thy whole mind, with all thy strength. Do this and you'll be saved. And that's what we're trying to learn in our life. And Father Molino, he has a book called, I don't remember what the name of it is, very old author. I think St. John of the Cross might even reference this man. Father Michael Molino. He says in one little part, I, I may put this on my website, this little passage from him. It's very beautiful. But at one point he said, God calls neither the neither the strongest nor the richest for their merit, but calls rather the weakest and the most wretched that his infinite mercy may shine forth the more. Because it's for God's glory. So, he takes people who are weak and wretched and he makes great saints out of them. Why? Because it shows forth his goodness. It shows forth his power because your sanctity is not your own. You have to cooperate. And that cooperation that you give will glorify God and it will give you merit and an infinite reward in heaven. That's what it does. However, it shows for, for first God's glory because it's only through his grace that you can be saved. Through your cooperation with it. You must cooperate with grace. It's not a gift that is given in baptism, for example. And after I'm baptized, that's it. I have to, I'm baptized, I believe, and I'm saved. It doesn't work that way. So, the effects of mortal sin, we talked about that. We went through that. The effects of mortal sin. You lose God's grace. You lose the right to heaven. It's an unfortunate thing, but this is the way God set it up. He set up because God gave us, as I mentioned before, because of the fact that God gave us an eternal, I should say, a infinite, in a sense, dignity through grace, because that is a, compared to our natural life, the, nat the natural life that you have, God didn't have to give you sanctifying grace. It's not required for you as a human being. You could live for God in your natural state as a human, without grace, and you would have a natural reward. Kind of like limbo. And you would know God with your intellect. Which is a great thing to do. On a natural level. But it wasn't good enough for God. He wanted more. He wanted to give himself more completely to the men he created. So he gave us this gift of an eternal reward in heaven if we would pass the test. That's the point, the test of your life. Now you have an eternal reward. And at the same time, if people do not pass the test, then the consequences are very severe. Why? That's the way God set it up. That's the way he set it up. And it's probably because, if you understand it, God has given you the opportunity to receive this infinite reward of Seeing God face to face as he sees himself and has been happy for all eternity already. All alone, the blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And he has given you this opportunity, this dignity. 
and for us to refuse it. I don't want your gift. I will be happy in my own way. Is such a tremendous insult to the, the gift that God is offering to all of us. That the punishment is grave. Very severe. That's the way God set it up. What we want to do now, though, is get into actual sin. I talked about actual sin. Remember, I will repeat for a few people anyway. Sin. There are two parts of, soul, of the soul. Your human soul. You have a human soul which is immortal. Okay, It will never die. It's a simple substance. It can't die. There's no way to split it in pieces. It is a unique, simple substance that is united to your body until death. Then it is separated from your body. This soul you have has two basic functions. Intellect, in which in the intellect, one of the parts of the intellect is the conscience, which we will talk about later. I'm not going to talk about it today. Conscience is a part of the intellect. It's a function of the intellect to make moral judgments in the here and now. That's the conscience. But you have an intellect to know things. You have a will to choose. Sin is committed where? Sin is committed in the will, not in your intellect. You don't commit a sin with the intellect. I explained that before. The intellect knows and has got a temptation, for example, to a bad thought, anger, hatred. But it's not a sin until the will gives credence to it and gives and revels in the thought of revenge, for example. If the will does that and does not try to remove the evil thought, then sin is committed. But it's difficult. We don't have perfect control of our intellect. And so it's difficult at times to remove a bad thought. Especially thoughts of the, regarding the sixth and the ninth commandment at times. Some people get those in their head. It's very difficult. And there are things they must do to try to eliminate them. So, when you look at what is actual sin, a sin is any, the most important word there is willful. That I choose with my will. So if somebody says, what is a sin? Any sin is a thought, desire, word, action, or omission contrary to the law of God. That's not true. It's got to be a willful thought. A willful desire. Action. Omission. So even with action... Something I do. Sometimes, I, we, you study this in theology and moral theology, but we're not going to get into detail, but sometimes a person is in a condition where he only has two paths. He has to choose one of two paths, and both are immoral. I will someday get into that when we get into conscience more. But, so he's not willfully choosing an evil path. It's just like if a man wants to kill somebody. Can you ever encourage a person to commit a sin? No, in the bottom line is no. You don't ever encourage somebody to commit a sin. However, they say it is okay if a man wants to kill somebody and he's ready to do it. It's, it's better if you can encourage him to just go out and um, beat up a dog. You don't tell people to beat up dogs either because that is wrong. Not because the dog has a right, but be, because of our duty to appreciate to some degree and respect God's creation. So we don't tell people to beat up dogs, right? But it would be better for you to encourage him, why don't you take your revenge out and your anger against my dog? Okay? You see what I'm saying? That makes sense, okay? So the moral theologians say that's okay when you when the person is determined to do something gravely evil and you can encourage him to do something far less. That's okay, because those are the only two paths a man might take. Um, you got to think about this in the, from the point of view of morals being taught in the perfect world, not in the actual world, if you know what I mean. So, it's a willful, that's the most important word. Anything I choose, that's a thought, desire, word, action, or omission, contrary to the law of God. That's a sin. 
that distinguish that tells us what a sin is. That's an actual sin. So, mortal sin is a serious offense against the law of God. St. Thomas defines mortal sin as an act whereby we turn away from God, our last end, willingly attaching ourselves in an inordinate manner to some created good. This is exactly, in a manner of speaking, what the devils did. Why the bad angels fell from God. They did not want to accept the plan of God for his creation. God, it is believed, I don't know if St. Thomas talks about it, he probably does. It is believed when I, from what I've learned that God revealed to them the mystery of the incarnation. That God the Son would become a man and lower himself below themselves because angels are a greater creation of God than men are, a higher order. Also, it was revealed, they believe, that the Blessed Mother would be the greatest of all men, the greatest of all God's creatures would be the Blessed Mother. And that was humbling, and they wouldn't accept it. So, what do men do? Men see something in this world, the goods of this world, and they choose them because they believe, they want to think and tell themselves, this will make me happy. I don't want the plan of God for what will truly make me happy. I want what will make me happy here and now. God's plan just takes a little longer to get to the happiness part at times. But if you want to be happy even in this life, this is the way. This way of living properly according to God's law is the only way to be truly happy. You can't have true and deep happiness. I'm talking about true happiness. You can have pleasures on the senses. Your five senses can have pleasure for a moment. But if it's contrary to God's law, you'll always end up with one thing. As soon as it's over, you have guilt. And that guilt gnaws at people often until they become sometimes insane and sometimes people do serious things against their own self because of the, the evil of that guilt that they can't handle. And so what do people tell people today? I learned psychiatrists, psychologists, some of those people, when they're trying to give counseling to people, they often tell them, go out and do things that you like even though they're sinful. They don't use the word sinful because they don't believe in sin, probably. But they make the person worse because they add guilt to guilt. What they probably need to know is their catechism and make a good confession if they want to get over that problem they have. So we turn away from God. We seek to have our happiness from something that is temporal rather than the way that God set it up. Now, there are things that are necessary to make a sin mortal. What happens when we commit a mortal sin? By the word, it is explaining to the, us that a mortal sin kills. It kills us. What does it kill? It kills the best part of you. Sanctifying grace. It destroys it in the soul. We lose all the privileges that come with sanctifying grace. We become God's enemy, as I mentioned. By sin. And then, God will pursue you. That's the beautiful thing. People think, and they have said, as I mentioned, that God, well, God still loves my children, even though they have lost the faith, they don't practice any morals, they live an evil life, but God still loves them. And so, we just leave them to God, because God will bring them back. No. That's not what the Blessed Mother said at Fatima. She explained the opposite. You pray for them, suffer for them, do penance for them. They will receive the grace of conversion. That's what she explains. We don't just leave them to their, their way of life and hope that they come back someday. But the p point is, is that God doesn't abandon the soul. That's the beautiful thing. God is His infinite love and mercy, but not love for that soul in that way that he loves the soul in the state of grace. It's his mercy. His kindness is so infinite. It is infinite. That 
he goes after the soul to prompt it. Come back to your true home. Come back and I will give you life again. That's what he wants to do. That's why he prompts people. That's why people's consciences are often disturbed. Why? Because either their angel or the Holy Spirit are prompting them. This isn't the way. Come back. And I will make you happy. So, these things about, these are very simply put in the Catechism about the requirements for sin to be mortal or sins to be venial. There are ways in which a sin can be venial. It gets a little, since you're adults now, in the catechism class, in the first communion class, for example, we teach these things. We're supposed to. I hope they do. They teach these things, and they can do them more simplistically. Now that we're adults, you need to understand them a little bit more deeply, a little bit more thoroughly. So, the first thing. The willful thought, desire, word, action, or omission must be what? As we mentioned. It must be something seriously wrong, contrary to God's law. Serious. Now, this is where we get into an error that is spreading today. A huge error. And I have one gentleman I know that comes here that was taught this error in his Catholic school. He admitted it eventually. He said he got a great education in the faith, and maybe he did, but this is one error. He did say, yes, that's what they taught us. Primacy of conscience, they call it. And it's taking a truth. This is modernism. St. Pius X talked about it in his encyclical. (coughs) Modernism. They take a truth, which we know about, for example, in this case, about conscience. That your conscience is number one, and I will explain that when we get to conscience, about how your conscience... You must follow it. And that's the bottom line. Everything else being equal. But you don't follow an erroneous conscience. So if I know my conscience is erroneous, I don't follow it. A child of ten is not able, normally, to make decisions of conscience regarding matters that are extremely grave and deep. Take, for example, in vitro fertilization. It's a unique thing that's being talked about and done today by people. But it's immoral. They don't understand. And a child of 10, 12 years old isn't going to know the answer. But if what they say today, what people are being taught today, well, young child of 10 or 12, if you think it's okay, then it's okay for you. If you think it's okay, young child, that you don't see that it's grave to miss Mass on Sunday without a reason, without a justifying cause. Then it's not a sin for you, Johnny. Why is in vitro? Why is it that wrong? in vitro fertilization? That's when women get fertilized by an existing. The words I don't want to. They get fertilized and become pregnant in a non-natural way. Okay. Let's just put it that way: no, an unnatural way, and it's, it's wrong. We will get into that. That's a whole different topic. We will. We can discuss that in detail, okay. or if you if. The group wanted to go into. I could prepare a class for it. Okay. It's it's deep. There's a lot involved, and uh, um, but I had to review it recently and for somebody, and uh, I did a lot of research on it, and it's wrong. But some people will say, well, that's okay because the end is the end looks really good. The purpose of doing it, oh, it's so wonderful. So therefore, it must be okay. It's wrong, and so if people that are young are making decisions like this, they're they don't have the formation of conscience to be able to make a decision. So, so they need to understand that. My conscience, I don't follow my conscience on something that is beyond me. So if I have some grave thing like this, or even more grave matters like this, what do I do? Do I just say, well, I'm going to figure it all out? Myself? No. I sometimes go for counsel with somebody that I have one or two people that I believe have good foundation. Uh, one priest is very old, very old, and, and he had a good education in the faith. Um, and so I can ask him, Father, what's the story? How do you see this? How do you explain this? I get my instruction. That's what children have to do. The conscience is something that has to be trained. You have a conscience from birth. Yes, God infuses certain basic fundamental principles of morality 
into you when he creates you. He does. Everybody knows, we know. When when you're growing up, you, you know right away it is wrong to kill somebody. That is a very fundamental moral concept that people have because of the way God created us. But we don't know the whole moral law and have a conscience all formed when we're young. That's why we need training. And we need to get our training. And if we don't have a well-formed conscience in all these matters, in certain things, you have to get it. You have to go out and search for it or find it or ask to be taught in certain things. And you are bound to do that. You are gravely bound to do that for the vocation that you choose in life. So if you choose a, a vocation in life, a certain vocation that requires a certain level of understanding of these moral principles, you must, you have an obligation to find out what those fundamentals are so that you can live that vocation according to God's law. Otherwise, you end up in what's called vincible, con, uh, vincible ignorance. Okay? Culpable ignorance. You know what culpable ignorance is? Um, culpable ignorance is ignorance that you're guilty of. In other words, it's your fault that you do not know what you need to know in this particular case to make a right decision. So, it, there's a lot here, and I'm, give me some time, and we'll hopefully explain it. But the, in terms of morals and sin and conscience, there are a lot of classes that I want to go over this. So, you can't get it all instantly. Let's put it that way. But the willful thought, desire, word, action, must be seriously wrong, or the sinner must consider it serious, seriously wrong. This is where you especially need to teach children when they're young. Because I found out, and I would ask children when I was teaching the little kids in catechism class, you teach them, okay now, Billy, if, if there's a dime on the table here and you steal that, is that a serious sin? Yes. They think it's a mortal sin to steal the dime. It's not. But then I've talked to others who hear confessions. And they don't understand where the dime keeps growing until it's a certain amount. They don't understand the amount where it becomes a mortal sin, where it becomes grave matter. He's hearing confessions. No one you know. I'll put it that way. I'm just saying. I'm just, it's not someone you know. But I know him. And I explained it to him. Oh, he said, Mark, that's really good to know. I didn't know. You didn't know that, Father? You heard my confessions. I never confessed. I stole, probably. But, uh, but <laughs> you should have known that. <laughs> uh, but, um, I'm sorry for my laughter. It's not a funny issue, actually. It's a very sad issue. Um, but we need to know. We need to know a certain level. So, the the important thing is, is that if the person truly believes that something is not seriously wrong, they think it is for some disturbing reason, because first of all, they may not have been trained when they were young to understand before their first communion, for example. They're supposed to know these things because they need to go to confession. And if you don't know what a sin is, how are you going to go to confession? Now, a little child could... I've seen little children steal candy out of a candy store. Now, if those little, that child I had seen thought that that was a serious sin, then she can't go to communion. This little girl I saw doing that. Uh, she can't go to communion until she would confess it. And she has to tell the priest, I thought it was a mortal sin. That's the detail that she has to tell. So, if you do something wrong, for example... It, this is in theory. If a person does something wrong and they thought it was a mortal sin, two minutes after they get done, they ask somebody, is it a mortal sin to steal a candy bar? Oh, no, it's not a mortal sin. Oh, okay, good. But if they believed at the moment they did it, two minutes before, that it was a mortal sin, then they're two minutes late because they, in fact, committed a mortal sin because that's what they thought they were doing. It's not just serious matter. That is a mortal sin. It's serious matter or something that is not serious, but the person thinks it's serious. Those are both 
grounds for something that we do wrong to make something mortal. However, along with the serious matter, thought, desire, word, action, or omission, we must also have the two other things at the same time. All three of these things have to be present at the same time for something to be, to be a sin, to be a mortal sin. Okay? The sinner must know that it's wrong. Okay? He must reflect at some point in time before his before the action or at the moment of the action the sinful action or at the moment he places a cause from which the sinful action will take place if i blow up a city when do i commit the sin i have a i have a 40 day wick on my bomb and i i lighted today when do i commit the sin of blowing up the city today or in 40 days when the bomb goes off. You commit it at the moment you start the wick. And if you change your mind, 20 days down the road, somebody came into town, I don't want to see them blow us out, take and cut the wick off and don't let it go. They still committed the sin because of the, they placed a cause from which that would happen. That they would, so they need to confess that. If I am determined to go over to my neighbor's house and beat him over the head with a bat or to take some young lady's purse and beat her over the head with a gun, if I want to do something like that, at the moment I decide to do it, that's when I commit the sin. But if I don't, because as soon as I go up to her, a policeman walks in the way, I think I'm going to stop. But I still need to confess it. Do I not? Because I was determined to perform the action beforehand. I was prevented. And you should tell the priest, this was my intention, I intended to do it, I started to do it, but a policeman got in the way. And so I didn't do it, Father. He say, I'm happy you didn't do it, but you're still guilty. And that needs to be confessed. But then, if it's confessed, with sincerity, with true contrition, supernatural, all the things required for something to be forgiven it has to have true, supernatural, sincere, entire contrition, which we will talk about some other day. That's contrition <coughs> related to the sacrament of penance, which is a beautiful sacrament. It is the sacrament of peace. You should learn to love the sacrament of penance. It is the sacrament of peace. You're being reconciled with God. He becomes again your spouse. He again dwells in your soul if you had the misfortune to lose him. And now you have an infinite reward waiting for you. Possibly a little penance to do in the meantime. But that penance is also in this world is sanctifying. Now, the last thing for something... And I'm running out of time already. Sorry. The last thing for a sin, for either, well, for a mortal sin, you must give full consent of your will. Okay? That's the, when the will act is performed. That's when the sin is committed. When I determine and I light the wick, I'm determined to blow up the city. I light the wick, even though it's going to take 40 days, I give full consent to doing that. At that moment that I give full consent, then it's a serious wrong. That's a mortal sin. So, if some, somebody is in a half stupor because of drink, for example, or because they're just waking up from sleep, and they don't give full consent, like a man who <coughs> had a gun on his nightstand with his phone, and the phone went off, <laughs> He got up and it's not funny. The poor man shot himself. He he just it was half awake and he picked up his gun and instead of picking up the phone that was ringing. And I, this is a true story. Uh, he shot himself. So very sad, but obviously he wasn't fully awake yet. And so he didn't commit a sin of suicide. He committed the action accidentally. 
but the, you must give full consent to the will. And we can go into that in more detail because I'm going to have to let you go. But all three of these things must be present at one time in order for a sin to be mortal. And it's very helpful to understand more of this detail, especially for temptations, because temptations can just wander in the mind for a long time, especially certain types of temptations that you might be prone to. They can dwell in the mind for a long time and a person gets confused. Did I give consent to it? Very good thing to understand. And don't ever let the devil tempt you and say, ah, you gave in because it's been there so long, you must have given in. No, don't think that way. Hold your ground. Very difficult at times. Hold your ground. But it's, you need to give full consent of my will, even though something is dwindling in my mind, I can't get rid of it. That's why the church recommends distract yourself with other things, work, occupations, things to keep you busy, to get it out of your mind. Those are helpful things. We will talk more about that later. I thank you for coming, and um, I wish I covered more, but next week, if you come back. So, thank you. You're welcome. Okay.